Hey guys, so I broke this video down into two parts, okay? Chapter 14, which is Origins of Life, and Chapter 15, which we'll see in Part 2. So Origins of Life, we're pretty much just seeing where did life come from and what spawned life in general. So first thing we got to talk about is uh, biogenesis and spontaneous generation. So biogenesis, biogenesis just means that... Um, Pretty much people believe, which what it really is, all living things come from other living things. So in other words, you know, you have a cell and that replicates into another cell, okay? And eventually it splits in the two, okay? So cells come from pre-existing cells, which is part of our cell theory. Now, spontaneous generation is just that cells pop out of nowhere, okay? And they just appear. Now, we know that today that this is not true, but in early times of scientists, spontaneous generation was what was accepted as truth, and scientists had to disprove this theory. So we're going to talk about a couple of those scientists. Now, the first scientist we have is Reddy. Now, Reedy, he, um, his observations led to the first questioning of spontaneous generation to see if it really existed. Now, what Reddy, Reedy did is he came up with three trials. The first trial, as we see right here, what he did is he left the jar open. Now, the early belief was that these flies right here, these flies appeared or spontaneously generated out of something called vital force. Now, vital force is just pretty much, in kind of layman's terms, like a magical power in the air that creates life. And so what he did, this was our control group here, now, our control group, he had our open jar, and obviously the flies formed. Now, in our two experimental groups, experimental, okay, in our two experimental groups, he showed that when the jar was tightly sealed, we did not, we're, we had no growth on the meat. Now, what was really interesting is when he put gauze over top of it, we had growth on top. The flies laid their eggs there. So, again, he was showing, you know, he made a control experiment. He was showing spontaneous generation may not be what it's all cracked up to be. But people did not agree with his findings originally. Now, let us to this next guy, this Italian, Spallazzani. Now, <clears throat> what he did is he boiled broth in a flask. And when he boiled it, um, what happened was, in this case, this was his control right here. And again, he just boiled the broth and he let the microorganisms grow. Now his experimental group, what he manipulated, he pretty much closed the flask and he shows that no growth appeared. Okay. Now what happened was when he removed it, he had growth. So this guy, he boiled broth and it became contaminated only when micro microorganisms from the air entered in this one right here. Now his opponents of biogenesis said that when he boiled, he destroyed its vital force. So what they said was that when he boiled it for so long and sealed it, he didn't allow the vital force to come in. And again, people were questioning, you know, biogenesis because of that vital force. Again, this is what people believed back then. Now, the person who kind of came up with the experiment that kind of put everything to rest was Pastor. Now, Pastor came up with this really cool, um, this really cool flask that had this curved, this curved little opening here. And what this did is it allowed uh, microorganisms, one, to collect at this spot right here, but still allowed the air to flow through. So in other words, what he showed is when he boiled it, air was allowed to come in, but because the microorganisms were not able to flow all the way through, he showed that it wasn't coming from the air or the magical force. It was coming from these microorganisms like what happens when I break it. So he created this curved flask, which prevented microorganisms from entering, but allowed air to enter from the outside. Again, this experiment was what proved biogenesis. Okay, This made biogenesis a cornerstone that we still support today in biology. And Pasteur was the guy who came up with this experiment to put spontaneous generation to rest now let's talk about how earth now this that was kind of how life was said to exist now we know life came from another cell okay now in 
early Earth's formation, how the Earth was said to form, was multiple collisions of space debris. So in other words, we had we had Earth, okay? And what happened was there's a bunch of these little pieces of Earth debris, and they all collided together, okay? And they formed a bigger piece, and keep colliding, keep colliding to form what we know as Earth. Now, when this was happening, we had a lot of molten rock being formed, okay? So... After all this, what they theorize and what scientists think is that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. Now, they know this by uh, radiometric dating, but 4.6 billion years is the best estimate that scientists have come up with of how old Earth is. Now, when they found this, they found this using a strategy called radiometric dating. And what radiometric dating is, determining the absolute age by comparing percentage of radioactive isotopes. Now, radioactive isotopes is the important part here because what a radioactive isotope is is when we have that isotope, energy is released as it decomposes as well as neutrons. So that neutron, when it is released, changes that molecule into a different isotopes. And we measure this using half-life. And half-life is the length of time it takes for half of any sample of an isotope to decay. Now, in living things, we usually use carbon-14. And carbon-14, its half-life is 5,730 er, 5, years. So in other words, if I have 100%, uh, let's use a different color, if I have 100% of carbon-14, okay, that is at year zero. So at year zero when it dies, it's going to have 100%. After 5,730 years, okay, we will have 50% of carbon-14. After another 5,730 years, we're going to have 25%. So as you can see, Every 5,730 years, we cut the amount of that molecule in half because it decays. Again, carbon-14 is the one that is used in living organisms because it has the shortest lifetime. Now, its useful range is only about 30,000 years. When we're looking at older things, we use a couple of these different isotopes. So, <clears throat> early Earth atmosphere. Now, in... The earliest ages of development, when living things were first coming around, our atmosphere was composed mostly of CO2, okay? CO2 and methane, okay? So, we had a lot of water vapor, methane, okay? So, H2O, carbon dioxide, but mostly carbon dioxide because really our first cells were... Um, Anaerobic, which pretty much means they do not use oxygen. Oxygen. Heterotrophic, they consumed other molecules. And so, uh, and our last part of this little puzzle we have here are prokaryotes. A little brain fart there. Okay, so anaerobic, no air, they use CO2. Heterotrophic, they consume their food, and prokaryotes, they did not have a nucleus. Now, what came along then was this thing called a cyanobacteria. Now, cyanobacteria is the first organism that produced O2. It used CO2 and converted that into o or oxygen using photosynthesis. So, in early times, we had a lot of water vapor, carbon dioxide, and what happened at, at this point, this is when those cyanobacteria began to um, appear and our oxygen concentration began to increase. So why these were important is cyanobacteria, um, they created O2 or oxygen. Now, they took that CO2 and they created oxygen. Now, what this did in the long run is oxygen then began to fill the atmosphere. So when oxygen filled the atmosphere, it then interacted or reacted with UV radiation and created ozone. 
Now, the importance of ozone is really underrated in early Earth development because ozone, it protects our DNA from UV radiation or, or from our UV rays. And what this does, what UV does is it mutates our DNA. So this ozone layer that we have above the Earth, so again, here's, here's Earth. Now we know we have this ozone layer, okay? So when, this, when these UV radiations, they strike that ozone, they bounce off, okay? This protects our DNA and allowed for these DNA organisms to evolve, which is why DNA is found in all life forms because that is what evolved first because UV radiation couldn't damage it. Now our first eukaryotes, they appeared by a process called endosymbiosis. Now endosymbiosis is simply just when a small aerobic prokaryote was engulfed and began to live and reproduce inside of large anaerobic. So when we formed our animal cells, what happened, they believe the animal cells formed first, mitochondria or an aerobic bacteria got engulfed by a prokaryote. These mitochondria then became repli or became uh, started replicating independently because they helped the cell out. So that formed our first animal cell. Then cyanobacteria came in, which were photosynthetic, and that's what caused our plant cell to form. Again, our first eukaryotic cells were pretty much formed by an engulfed um, aerobic bacteria and an engulfed chloroplast or cyanobacteria because they perform photosynthesis. So this is that idea. Now the evidence we have, both mitochondria and chloroplast, they replicate independently from the cell's um, replication cycle and they contain their own circular shaped DNA. Now if we know anything about prokaryotes, Prokaryotes contain circular DNA inside of it, okay? So this evidence is kind of where we came up with this theory. So that's pretty much how life began on Earth. Hopefully this video helps you out. Mr. O'Brien, signing off.